Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We're talking trading strategies and we're going to be focusing on trading in a lot of different commodity ETFs, the ones that uh, have the stocks within them, as well as talking Bitcoin and a quick comment on markets. I am chatting right now with T.G. Watkins, Director of Stocks at Simpler Trading, also editor of the Profit Pilot website, which I will post a link to in the show notes. Now, TG, usually we focus more on uh, the broad markets, individual sectors within the markets, but I want to spend more time talking about commodity sectors and those ETFs because, look, commodities continue to run, especially on the precious metals side. We're having a bit of a breakout in silver today. Gold continues to be in an uptrend. There's momentum here. So let's get your trading strategies on all of these, starting with GDX. GDX has finally just broke just above recent highs or actually those most important highs I think back in 2020 it's been a interesting pattern here where we know how well GDX and the miners have done but also people are saying that it's lagging gold I'm curious on the chart pattern here uh, TG how important is GDX's action where do you see it going how would you trade it yeah, so far so good. I think with last time we talked about it, it did say it was it's a pretty choppy thing. You know, it is an uptrend. It has been in a nice channel, but it has definitely been oscillating quite a bit within that channel, mostly respecting the daily 50 and mostly respecting the weekly 21. And it just kind of needed to navigate some of its previous all time highs, as you said, kind of going back from 2020, even in you know, 2022, stuff like that. This last one, it pulled back into the daily 50 and then that helped launch it up into its new all-time highs here so yeah everything is fine with it it's just it's just a little bit messy but otherwise it's in an uptrend and as far as the discrepancy between gold and gdx some people have been talking about that there there might actually be a, a bit of a vacuum there so maybe gdx actually has a, a lot of room to run to the upside because it has to play catch up for how much gold has moved so the lagginess could actually be a good thing if that is the way it wants to go now, is this a momentum trade here as well? Because look, GDX is up seven out of the last eight months. Even the one month that it was down, it was marginally down. You look at that monthly chart and it is up, up, up. And now with this breakout, how does that impact trading strategies? Yeah, I mean, people tend to go with what's working. And when it's clearly something like this and making new highs, it's getting a lot of attention. So yeah, it's going to be attracting eyeballs and traders and money and people are just going to be going into something because it's what's working I, I know a lot of traders that are kind of agnostic to what they trade they just look for something that's good and working and that's exactly what's happening here so sure yeah it's good it's a momentum play any comments on the low volumes gdx even gdxj these volumes are almost historically low no, I don't really pay too much attention to that. If anything, another way that I've been looking at this and preparing for the GDX trade was I looked around and I like to look at leveraged ETFs for sectors because sometimes they'll actually tell you a little bit more information than the original underlying. So if you guys look, actually look at GDXU, you'll see that over the last few months, a crap ton of volume has been coming into it. So if you're wondering where the volume is, dare I say this is where it is uh, because people are looking at this and they want leverage on it. Maybe you don't play options, so you play the leveraged ETF. The GDXU also double bottomed on a longer time frame. Like if you look at the monthly, you can see the double bottom. And then you can see over the last few months, it's gotten over the monthly 10, held that moving average, and is now starting to move up. So this was the thing that really kind of kept me and my eyeballs on the, the gold miner sector is because something like this looked pretty good. It was back a couple years ago, I was looking at the semiconductors, SOXX versus SOXL. And SOXX didn't necessarily give me any clues, but if you look at SOXL, there was a lot of volume that came in at the lows, and it's because either institutions or hedge funds or somebody with more volume than me was recognizing that this was the low, they want to leverage, they go in, and that's basically how you can track some of their bigger footsteps. Interesting. Very good point on that GDXU. There has been a lot more volume there. Let's also just quickly talk about gold then, because gold was making a run. Well, it's still over 2700, making a run up to that 2800 level. What's your take on this gold price, which in all fairness has even better momentum than something like GDX and GDXJ? Well, that's my kind of my point. I mean, if the gold miners are to follow gold because they do better and profit more, and so the companies and the stock will do better when the va the value of what they mine is going up, then sure, there's a there's going to be a lag, but that also means that they could play catch up. 
And gold, you know, you're asking me earlier, like, well, where's the top? It's like, I don't know. I'm not going to try and predict where the top is or something like that. Yeah, it's getting a little bit frothy. Yeah, it's getting outside of some of the metrics that I use. But I'm not going to go step in front of a freight train and say, oh, I think we're going to short this. No. If anything, maybe you kind of take some off when it gets a little bit too high. You wait for a pullback and get some back on. Or if you're just looking to buy the dips, you just wait for a little bit of a dip, which we had, I don't know, last week or two, something like that. But we should notice when there's a bigger change in trend. And until that happens, I mean, you just ride this thing and keep it going because clearly it's going up. So you just, you know, when something's good, stay with it. Let your winners ride. Now, what about looking at something like GDXJ, the junior gold miners ETF? You mentioned the leverage in the actually leveraged GDXU. GDXJ, that's also like GDX. It's not even to its high back in 2020. Is there more of an opportunity here because this one just hasn't run as much? No, I wouldn't necessarily say that. So for, for me and how I look at these things, yes, it is technically lagging GDX because it hasn't surpassed its previous all-time high, sure. But if you, the, but the patterns are the same. So basically, it's going to move in the same way. And so I'm, I'm going to say that basically it's going to go up in the same way as GDX. It just maybe started from a lower point or its value was lower than previously or something like that. So I don't think that there's going to be any advantage there. Interesting. Let's also talk about silver miners ETF then SIL. As I said, silver's having a breakout today. But again, you look at this ETF and it's nowhere close to those highs in 2020, but it has been in a very nice uptrend and silver usually can provide that sort of leverage on gold. Silver miners, you would assume provide a leverage on that. What are you seeing in that SIL chart? Yeah, SIL also looks great. I've been looking at this thing. You can It looks in a way very similar to GDXU. It's had a long-term double bottom over the last couple of years. And on the monthly chart over the last few months, it's really just flagged into a sharply uptrending monthly 10. And clearly it's breaking out now. In fact, most recently, I made a couple of videos on my Profit Pilot newsletter on YouTube also about this saying, I didn't talk about SIL, I talked about SLV, but there was a move up to about 30 and I said, hey, I don't think this is where it's really gonna break out. I think we should expect to pull back first. And we did, and you can actually see SIL, it pulled back not quite into the daily 50, but below the daily 21, right on, let's see, October 9th. And that was the pullback to support consolidation that gave it the momentum and the ability to really break up. And so that was the pullback I was looking for. And if you actually look at SLV, it was the same thing right on yeah the 8th and the 9th you know before that actually up on at the end of september you could see price came up to a previous resistance level double top and wasn't going to break out right there i said wait for a pullback you get that pullback on the 8th and the 9th and then it shoots right up from there and then breaks out past 30. so yeah clearly everything is doing well going and doing fine you know if sil is lower than SLV. Okay, so there's a lag effect, but I'm not sure if I'm really too concerned about, oh, you know, SIL isn't breaking out past its all-time high uh, on the monthlies from 2021. I more care that it is making a double bottom and it's on its way up. So it's all relative. If you can get in at the bottom, great. It doesn't matter that it didn't surpass its highs as long as you made money from point A to point B. And that's, I think that's really what people are going to be concerned about. Yeah, good point. And even to your point about that pullback in early October, that was a shallow pullback. So what does that mean for the potential of this run now that it has broken out higher? It's great. I mean, there's really, there's no no two ways about it. It's, it's looking really well. I mean, the monthly, weekly all did great. They pulled back into these moving averages. And a, a shallow pullback, I mean, the pullback on SIL on the 8th and 9th was really into another level that you could look back at May and July and all that kind of stuff. And so it really just pulled back, tested support, and then took off again. So from a technical standpoint, everything's doing great. Yeah, sure looks like it. And even SIL, man, that's had a lot more volume in it as well. Let's also move to COPEX. So Copper Miners ETF here. This has also had more volume this year. It went through a breakout earlier in this year, and then it went through a multi-month pullback, June, July, August. But September was a strong rebound month. Hasn't quite got back up to those highs from May. What are you seeing in the COPEX chart? Well, you know, if the silver and gold and all that stuff is kind of any indication, I'm seeing very similar technical patterns. You look at the monthly and, it, you know, we've had a big breakout on the monthly all the way back in May or so, made new highs. OK, got a little overbought, got a little frothy, pulled back to the monthly 10 support, which looks about August, September. And now we're back up. And so I would say that this looks very good, very healthy. 
it's basically consolidating. It's flagging sideways into these higher time frame moving averages. And then you can see also on the daily, we've had another pop up that uh, basically had to happen at the end of September. And then now we're pulling back in October. This all looks pretty good. And this pullback that we are currently looking at COPEX is pulling back into an uptrending daily 50. And if it starts to hold somewhere around here, this is probably going to be the consolidation move that then takes it up and breaks it out just like silver. So if you look at silver and you look at COPEX, you should visually, if you're familiar with looking at charts, it should actually be able to see a lot of similarities and say, oh, I think I see the roadmap of how this is going to work. Yeah, COPEX looks great. Yeah, that's a very good point. A lot of these charts are looking fairly similar. And the big takeaway from my standpoint is this, the rising moving averages and these dips being relatively shallow and bought back quite quickly. Let's talk uranium then. Let's start with the uranium ETF, URNM. That's a mining ETF. Sprott, Sprott runs that one. Look, it, it had some weakness again, kind of at the tail end of summer. But ever since the calendar turned to September, it has been up, 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 taking back a lot of that corrective move. We've talked uranium a lot. Are you still bullish on this uranium ETF? Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to be bullish on this. I will say the last time that you and I spoke, when we talked about uranium and all that in the nuclear stocks, I underestimated how strong these were and just how much demand and how much news was coming out about these things. So for, let's just say, look at URNM, the last time we spoke about this, it was at maybe $47 early October, something like that. And usually from a technical standpoint, okay, there's your first move up. And then I look for price to pull back. I was curious if it was going to pull back to uh, $44, $45, something like that. Just something like, you know, silver pulled back, COPEX pulling back. I was thinking uranium was going to pull back too. And so I didn't really want to go buy it up here at the highs. Well, Again, so much news, so much demand. We got Microsoft with Three Mile Island. We got Amazon. We've got OpenAI investing in some of these things. So all of a sudden, massive amounts of interest and demand came in. And instead of pulling back, they really just kind of flagged. And then really the spot was, if we look here, October 14th, 15th, and then 16th is where it popped. But on October, well, let's see, 14th and 15th, URNM, pulled back into the hourly 50, then got on top of the hourly 50. And I'd say right there was where the fact that it held the hourly 50, then started to move up was the next you know, proper entry to get in from a technical standpoint. I was a little late to the game. I did get into NNE and that one's been doing great for us. I think we're up 35% in, in a week. So I'm happy about it. There's plenty of opportunities out there. But yeah, I totally got that one wrong because, or at least underestimated it because I thought things were gonna you know, do their normal patterns, but too much demand with all that uh, news coming out for how are we going to pow power AI? And basically it looks like it's going to be nuclear. Oh man, that news that's come out, especially with large tech companies, right? Coming in, providing potential sources of money. That's huge for the sector, if, huge for commodity sectors broadly. What about some of the stocks too? You look at UEC, that's more than doubled in less than two months. CCJ, that's also had an extremely strong rebound. Are you more into some of the uranium stocks over the ETF then? Yeah, I'd be happy with it. In fact, I did a little bit of back testing and I would, my personal pick would be UEC it moves more. So I'd like to do that. Or if I think there's actually a leveraged ETF, I think it's URAA. So for me, I like leverage, but I don't like trading options. And so I would be looking at the URAA as a leveraged uranium ETF. It's still a little skosh as far as volume. So maybe I'm not interested in it right now. But yeah, I like UEC. I like CCJ. I mean, they're all doing great. And URNM is going to be the ETF, you know, I just, I'm still having a hard time buying them up here. UEC is, has broken out past its all time high, but I don't really want to buy the breakout high. I'd rather buy something a little bit in. And since I missed the opportunity last week, because I underestimated all the news and demand, I just have to now wait, but that's okay. Cause we are in N and E and we got in uh, about $17.2 and now we're up at 24. Point seven. So yeah, I, I found my ship and I'm happy with it. Okay. So I guess broadly, if we just want to recap trading strategies for a lot of these resource and commodities ETFs, especially driving down into the equities, you're buying dips and you still see a very strong market. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, there could be a chance where these things get a little bit ahead of themselves. You know, all that news with the big tech companies comes out, you know, everyone buys it. And, and it's at some point going to get a little frothy, sure. And there will be some pretty wild moves in this. But generally speaking, it's hard to say that you know anything else but up is going to happen. Just make sure you pick your points. You don't want to go buy the top and then have it pull back on you 30%. You know, it could be a little uncomfortable. So uh, be reasonable with it. But yeah, they're up. They're doing well. There's a lot of demand. And it seems like uh, nuclear is going to be where they're going to try and take us as far as the, our next power source. Now, is there some sort of strategy that investors can use that tells them that a dip is at a reasonable point to buy? Is there a percentage you look at, moving averages, that our listeners can take a little bit of education away from? Yeah, there are numerous answers to that, and that's what makes a market. Uh, you got Fibonacci's. You know, a lot of times there's a 50 or 60 percent pullback. Um, there's moving averages that you can use, like pull back to the daily 50, maybe pull back to the daily 21 or the hourly 50. Uh, yeah, there are levels, there are trend lines, there are support and resistance. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff that you can use. I personally like to use moving averages. And in this case, I was expecting some of these things to pull back to the daily 50, but because they were so, so much demand at news, they really only pulled back to the daily 21 which is still perfectly reasonable because, well, that's another moving average that I use. I just was looking for one and we got the other. So I was caught a little bit flat-footed on that one. But that's why I traded NNE because it did perfectly pull back to the daily 21, gave me the entry I needed. I saw what was happening in, for the rest of the industry and I just jumped on board and said, all right, let's go. And as far as my entry, we're up 40, you know, 44% in five days. So, yeah, nice. you know, well, <laughs> no complaints well there. Yeah. yeah, no complaining on that one. Uh, let's also move over to the crypto space. Let's talk Bitcoin because, look, early 2022 was really rough for Bitcoin. And it more or less consolidated some of those losses throughout 2022. And then 2023, Bitcoin was moving higher almost consistently and started off this year very strong. Had a bit of a pullback earlier this year. It went up to almost 74,000, pulled back to right around 50,000. Now it's creeping back up to that 70,000 level. TG, what is Bitcoin going to do from here? Are we looking at all-time highs sometime soon? Yeah, I have always been bullish on Bitcoin, uh, especially since it finally started coming back. And even though it, it made new all-time highs, well, let's see, March of 2024, but it started to pull back. You know, it had way too big of a run. It kind of broke up and out. It got a little bought and needed to come back down. But I've been telling people like, I'm bullish on Bitcoin. It's just a matter of when and at what level. And so we've been very patient with it. It's been pulling back for about six or seven months. And, you know, whatever, how, hey, however much time it needs, just let it do its thing. And then what I noticed over the last couple of weeks is it changed character. On the daily chart, it pulled into the daily 50. So again, like, you know, what levels do you use? Okay, I like the 50 and I like the daily chart and all that kind of stuff. It did a double bottom pullback into the daily 50. Very similar to what we're seeing with CopEx, right? Look at these things. Look at silver, SLV. They move in similar ways. You know, charts and patterns move similar. That's why we can trade with technical patterns. And then if you actually look at Bitcoin from, the, from its peak to where it's been pulling back, you can actually draw a channel. And as of the last five or six days, it has broken out of that channel. These are all technical things that we look at to make sure that the market's doing what we want it to do and giving us signals. So we bought BitX, B-I-T-X, which is the 2X leverage ETF of Bitcoin. So again, I like leverage, but I don't like options. And then the other big thing is if you look at the monthly chart, or even if you just you know take a bigger chart and stand back, there is a massive cup with handle. I mean, the top of the peak is you know, November of 2021. And then the other one was March of 2024. That forms the cup. And then the six or seven month pullback has been the declining handle. That's a huge pattern. And the fact that it's breaking out right now, I am 100% bullish on Bitcoin. I don't know where it's going to go though, but this is a huge pattern that is basically a tried and true. I mean, going back from how to make money in the stock market with William O'Neill, I mean, a cup and handle pattern. And you see this on a monthly time frame and a product like this i think just i think you know be bullish on bitcoin yeah hey man there's a lot to be bullish on out there let's wrap it up with a quick comment on the broad averages the s p just a couple days ago was back at all-time highs it almost reached 5900 now we're seeing a little bit of weakness today but overall look the markets continue to be strong as well so what's your assessment of these markets Yep, still strong. Everything's fine. There will be pullbacks. There will be big liquidation breaks. There will be consolidation. You know, of course, all that normal stuff. 
But I think that the market has bigger things it's looking at. The economy isn't falling apart, or at least that's what they tell us, and interest rates are coming down. So we are in an interest rate cutting cycle, and we have Bitcoin up, we have small caps up, we have biotech up. I mean, we have everything looks like it's firing on all cylinders. So there might be some turbulence around the election. Maybe the market kind of just goes flat when we get closer into the election. Maybe the market gets really volatile after the election because maybe the election results are being debated. All that can very much be true. But I think that the bigger trajectory of what's happening with the market right now, despite the election and whoever wins, I think that the big picture, if we continue looking on, will be higher into the future. All right. TG, thank you very much for your time. I always find it so interesting to see and hear how you are trading these markets. And hey, thanks for focusing on the opportunities in some of these commodity sectors that we follow very regularly. Again, TG Watkins, Director of Stocks at Simpler Trading, also editor of the Profit Pilot website. Click that link in the show notes. TG, we'll chat again in another couple of weeks. Great. Thanks so much.